welcome to the Catholic Entrepreneurship and Design Experience monthly grab session. Thank you for coming. This month, we'll be digging deeper into Module 9, Communicating Value. Just think of these groundwork sessions as our small group work session. If we could be together in person, you'd know those assembled here as colleagues who bring their knowledge and passion for learning to share and challenge each other. This group gathers to collaborate, share best practices, and challenge each other to not only improve how we deliver the seed material, but also to challenge the seed material itself to improve. We'll begin with a prayer, and then we'll get our hands in the mud and know that this work will bear great fruit in the lives of the students and ourselves. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. By the way, St. Ambrose, pray for us. So welcome and thanks for coming. My name is John Bakira and I am the director of the SEED program and with my colleague Kieran Roach and then our very good friends uh, who are delivering the SEED material in various ways. And thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. So just a quick uh, talk to uh, point about the groundwork session rules. There are only a few. Uh, of course, all the rules of, uh, of uh, civilized life pertain, but then we've added a few more. Number one, have fun. I mean, life is short and it's hard and it's challenging. So you might as well have some fun. And we like to have fun by being curious, asking questions. In fact, wonder is one of the five founding principles of the SEED program. We believe it creates a culture of vocation. And sometimes in order to do that, you have to suspend your disbelief. So just wrestle it to the ground and then you can judge us later because you will anyway. And then let's collaborate because SEED is a collaborative effort and we really need your help. Now, before we dig into module nine, just a couple of housekeeping pieces. Uh, we've had uh, quite a significant change to the dual enrollment process. And Elena, you have been a, a, an essential part in figuring that all out. So one major change is that when it's time to submit your work, for dual enrollment, that is when it's time to do your Catholic University of America application, but only then. So instead of it being at the very beginning, and we've we've fixed all this in the documentation. So it's uh, in, you know anyone that's seeing this for the first time, just know that you're reading what's there and you'll follow the proper steps. But at the end now, when a student wants to submit their material, their work in the seed program for dual credit at the Catholic University of America, do the CUA ap application after the fact, and so we've got a little link for that that's in all the documentation materials. And then we have a place for you to upload your capstone work, which is your Odyssey project presentation and your moral course. And again, there's a link in the documents for that. And then once those two pieces are done, email yours truly at jon at cprogram.com to arrange for tuition, adjudication, and credit. That's when we'll close the loop on that. Now, for all the other students who are beginning program, this is essential, right? So those of you that are leading students through, quick reminder that before they do anything else, any blocks or modules, it would be really awesome if they could do the pretest. And it's really simple. In fact, it's so simple. It's basically just a form to collect the number of students, their information, who their teacher is, and what school they go to. And if you're a homeschool uh, student, just get, put in the name of your homeschool students, uh, it, whatever the name is, that's fine. Um, but basically the pretest allows us to track numbers of students that are starting the C program. And that doesn't mean that uh, it's just for the ones that are doing the whole shoot and match, it's everybody. So if you're at a camp or a club, if you're doing one, of, one piece of it or all of it, and, or if you're doing it in all kinds of different order, that's fine. Just that first thing that you do, if you would take that pretest. And the other thing that it has in there is that essay question and really, it's a simple answer. What is the purpose of business? And we want it in your words, how you would answer that question before you start the seed program. And that way we can measure on the back end when you do your testimonial, we can we measure how that answer has changed, right? So then, and this is all written up in the material. 
uh, for all students who are finishing the program, even if they're not interested in submitting for dual credit at Catholic University of America, even if they only did a little or some or out of sequence even, have them submit their testimonial, and we've got a link for that. And this helps us, again, know how many students, but this time, how many are completing the program. And it asks the same question as the pretest. What is the purpose of business? Engaging from the pretest and the post-test answers, we'll know how many students finished, or how many students began, how many finished, and then how their answers to that very important question has changed. So there's that piece. Any questions from you all? Pretty straightforward. Right. right. Yeah. And, and then, and, and John, in my case, we're going to have to, I, I, you know, do the, the post test, but I will have to provide some data from the pretest, right? So from last year. Yes. Yeah. The early adopters will have to adapt as they are tend to. That's great. Mm -hmm. So then, um, huge announcement. We've got two events that we're planning for next summer. One of them is the Seed Summer Academy. It's, it's June 20th through 24th at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. The fee for that is $1,000. That covers everything but your transportation to and from campus. So you get yourself there and get yourself home. We'll take care of everything else there. And I promise that this will be an impactful four-day, well, it's three full days and two half days, uh, entrepreneurial experience. I don't want to give too much away, but basically our goal is to treat you like a entrepreneurship consultant and build small teams, cohorts of entrepreneurial consultants that then embed themselves into local organizations that are working to, to make an impact on things like hunger, poverty, um, uh, housing, and also caring for the elderly. And uh, so then you'll, your goal will be to help those organizations make a greater impact in that very short amount of time. So big challenge. I know you're up for it. And we'd love to have you there. We've got about 100 seats. And we do, in fact, have some scholarships set aside. Nothing that's a full ride. Uh, we want everybody to have a little bit of skin in the game. But uh, those will be based on economic need. So that's the Seed Summer Academy, formerly known as the Summer Business Institute, which was uh, a product, a, an experience put on by the Bush School of Business. And so we're going to rebrand that and call that the Seed Summer Academy. And then especially for this group here, we would like to host the first ever Seed Facilitator Conference in July of 2022 at the campus of the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Now, this is where we actually, we have some ideas. Um, I've been involved in helping teachers put together professional development events for years and years and years. And one thing I know for sure is that it's best to ask ahead of time what it is that you would like to do. Now we could do all kinds of stuff. Like we could make it a boot camp, we could make it a community event, we could make it a respite event, or we could try to combine all that together. And but we'd like your feedback on that. So if you are part of the seed facilitator community working inside of Basecamp, there's a nice little uh, piece in the forum for you to sound off on what you think that ought to be. We'd love to hear from you first. And we are committed to making this event less than or equal to $500 for the registration fee. Now, in that case, you won't be staying on campus. Now, you could stay in the dorms if you wanted to, but in my experience, uh, veteran teachers and folks of, uh, of uh, earned age uh, tend to not like dorm room life so much. So um, that's an option for you, but essentially for that $500 or less, you get yourself to the campus and uh, you find a hotel, which we'll, we'll find some uh, block rooms to get a discount. And we'll share that information with you. But uh, otherwise, we'll take care of it. So you have that, our promise today, two events next summer, really important stuff. We're very excited and we'd love to host you and your students for those two events. And the other thing that I want to touch on, too, is I, ha I have this, uh, this friend of mine, Daniel Fountainberry, who has been a classroom teacher. Now he's a tech entrepreneur. He's got a couple of different things cooking. One of them that I wanted to share with you is called coteacher.com. Basically, the idea that the classroom is like one of the most defined silos in the world, right? When you're in that classroom, it's just you and your students. And Daniel's idea with coteacher.com is to bring forth a platform to connect teachers so that they can collaborate together to build educational material and uh, make collections of educational material. And Seed is one of those. So we're working on that. And I, I'm really excited to share with you that they're, they caught up to us in the groundwork sessions as of today. 
the all of the seed material is there all the way through module nine. And uh, so if you're interested in that, just go to coteacher.com and you can sign up for a free account. And then we are the only ones doing anything with entrepreneurship on that platform right now. So if you're curious, go check it out, coteacher.com. So if you were here last time, or if you watched the video from module eight groundwork session, you saw a new methodology. We have the wonderful wisdom and experience and training of our colleague, Kieran Roach. And he was uh, instrumental in bringing forth this new model of groundwork sessions. And so what we're gonna, what we did last time was that I kind of took the lead and through all the content and all the gotchas and things to look for and how the flow is. And then Kieran brought forth his pedagogical wisdom, right? All of that training from the University of Notre Dame and from his experience in the classroom to help the rest of us really understand the methodology, really understand the pedagogy, right? Pedagogy, what a fun word. Pedagog is literally from the Greek, the person that walked your kids to school. Pedagog, right? Anyway, fun thing, uh, fun little etymological fact there. So we liked it so much, we decided to <coughs> really double down on that. So this time, instead of going, I'll do the content for the whole module, and then Kieran will do the pedagogy and methodology for the whole module, we're actually going to kind of do trade-offs, right? So I will take the content for block one, and then Kieran will take the methodology and kind of give the, the, the actual inside baseball of what's happening. So I'll, and then we'll switch back. So block one, flip-flop, block two, flip-flop. Ah, I could try to explain it to you. Um, but the, uh, best thing to do is we'll do first talk later that's my favorite pedagogical theory right there so if you don't have it yet uh you might go ahead and pop up the module nine lesson guide because we're going to be walking through that bad boy today on this wonderful what is it's june uh, it's it's september everybody module nine communicating value so when you pull that up what i noticed first was the project, right? In the seed material, every module has a deliverable and we call that the project. And in this particular case, we're in module nine of 12. So we're getting really close. Module 12 is where the deliverables of the Odyssey project and the moral compass uh, happen. And so we're really close, right? We're only two more modules and then it's gone. So this one in particular, uh, the project is actually to do a, pr uh, a video of a practice run of, you might say, and that might be a good way to couch it. Karen, you can check me on that later, but maybe just tell your students, this is a, 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 a test run, a little still real, if you will, a little sneak preview of what your Odyssey project is about. The students are tasked with the deliverable of a three minute video preview of each student's Odyssey project. And so what's, what's in the student prompt is always a good question to ask because every seed module has a student prompt and that gets theoretically the methodology is it gets delivered to the student before they begin any work in module nine or the module at hand and so and what i noticed in the prompt was something that i am all kinds of evangelizing to try to kill this myth i guess that would be anti-evangelizing i don't know if it's a word uh but we're trying to help students get over what i call the myth of the maverick and we'll get more into that Right. But it also calls to mind and reminds your students way back into module three to think back to the four S's, the four S's. Basically, in my mind, these are the four S framework is a way to encapsulate every problem that is solved by an entrepreneur. You've got scarcity. You've got self-interest. You've got subjective value. And the, the problem that starts with an S that the entrepreneur probably needs to solve for themselves, sunk cost. So the prompt harkens back to that module three experience. And so if you're if you're jumping ahead and you didn't do module three and here you are in module nine, it's okay. You can cover the four S's if you want to. It's, it's not uh, rocket surgery. It's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of supporting material there. But the mission prompt is that share the story behind your Odyssey project. I love origin stories. I love to know how things got started. I love etymology. I love learning about culture from, from the origin. Uh, it just really helps to understand what's going on. And so this project that they're delivering is kind of just like what's on their mind about it. And it's not first take either. There's in, in the module, you'll see there is pedagogy around them practicing and developing and scaffolding. Kieran, I learned a new word, scaffolding from our last session together. 
And then the module nine project prep is a small group pro practice. So it actually tips its hat to that as well. Uh, and then the module nine product deliverable has some very specific things in there, which we'll get into as, as well. Uh, but it talks about, um, it basically tees them up. So that is kind of the very first blush at what the content is. So then I'll hand it over to my dear friend and colleague, Kieran Roach, to talk about the module project from a pedagogy and instruction point of view. Kieran Roach. Great. Thanks, John. So in uh, education speak, we sometimes use the term spiraling curriculum. So you might hear that come across. And that's this is an example of that where the curriculum intentionally spirals. So this is as, as those that are new to education don't say, oh, I've already done this already. I'm going to. I'm going to just gloss over this because they've already done it. It's actually intent and it's good educational pedagogy to spiral and reheat these major concepts and this part. And so um, definitely that Odyssey project really helps brings, brings that out um, too, as well as um, it's really important to, to know. When we talk about the Odyssey project too, I'm going to share my screen. I really want to distinguish the difference between what we use in education as formative and summative assessments. And so this is where, depending on if we have school um, teachers that are using this in the way of teaching, in the way, think of a formative assessment is something that informs your instruction. So it's a smaller assessment. So those are ones that are more in the block. And what we're doing here in the Odyssey project is this idea of a summative insect, uh, assessment. And you can see here in this category here, where we talk about these final projects. So it sums up a, a large piece of work, this being the seed curriculum that we have. And so um, I'll put this link in the chat so those that can have access to it if, if you need that. So again, more for specifically those that are using this in an educational setting, understanding the difference between the summative and the idea of a formative assessment uh, with that. And so the Odyssey project is what we would consider this summative assessment and typically, and it's done here individually on their own. And that's where that assessment comes in. Whereas the formative assessment is informs, can they do so? So this little check in this prompt is, is also that little formative assessment leading to that summative. You're checking in to see, are they gonna be able to do this final assessment when it comes to it at the end for that? And so that's that pedagogy around the difference between the formative and summative and how the Odyssey project hits in on that. Any questions? One, one question of, yeah, yeah, one question of clarification. So this, this idea of spiraling, right? I, I've never heard that, but basically what you're saying is go back. It's okay to go back and touch on work that we've already done. You know, my experience in, in especially, well, my experience is only in Western education. I, I've only been involved with teaching in the United States of America, but it feels like our education is very repetition averse. If you have to do it again or, or go back, that feels like a negative regressive type of thing. But what you're saying, Kieran, is that it's actually... This is actually a te technique that teachers use. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and it actually leads to more enduring understanding, right? That that it's not one and done and forget, but it's like, oh, that's where and and if done well, it builds up onto each other, as it does here with that. That we're all building towards this Odyssey project, and that's where coming back to the Odyssey project in in seed is the real nature of the spiraling curriculum that it, it's aligning back to to the intent and purpose of what you want students to walk away with and have this enduring understanding. Wow. Thank you. Any other questions before we keep going? I was wondering, Karen, um, when we're talking about a spiraling curriculum, is it more the teacher just keeps representing a concept that we touched on maybe a couple of modules ago, or is it more the students reflecting the concept that they learned a couple of modules ago? Yeah, great, great question. So one, it depends on the on the curriculum, right, depending on the, the breadth here. So in this situation, I would say just how robust that seed has has a lot of content that's covered in seed. With that, um, I would say that it's to really bring about that this um, the Odyssey project. Remember, is just is that kind of that main thread 
and then you and you and it's it's the curriculum circling it around that odyssey project so that's where always bringing it back to um when you're looking at a module how can we bring this back to that main project could help here and then what you mentioned is is it a strategy and we, we touched a little bit on that last month which was at bats which is more just the more opportunities you can get students to engage in a in in the work is also another great strategy and that's and then multiple ways too so that's ways that if if you if you feel that they struggled and didn't hit the objective of that block which we touched on that's where you can then let's do it again but let's now don't do the same thing the same way let's see if we can use it in another context that's a little bit different to spiraling that's more just at bats is more of the the you want them engaging back into that assessment and that's also that distinction between the the idea of a formative and summative assessment that formative assessment you see oh my gosh the student didn't get it they totally bombed this question you're not going to leave that as an educator you want to come back and say how can i represent it that's that in a sense isn't spiraling that's just good teaching that you inform that mm. but then the the good good content or good pedagogy will do it naturally as the curriculum does with that and it's, it's actually more in the math concept where it's actually more fascinating when you do it with math as it builds on each other can i just add here to the credit of my very good friend and colleague here in roach anyone that's interested in becoming a better teacher he turned me on to a series of books called teach like a champion and the first one there, you know there's a there's three books out there and i bought them all the first one it's like 49 techniques that are very specific oh my goodness i mean i love that kind of thing like just tell me what to do right or, or tell me not what not to. i'm like a puppy right rub my nose in it if i do it wrong right this is like gold. The I think I spent maybe 25 book bucks on Amazon to get Teach Like a Champion. This is worth its weight in gold. It comes with a DVD and, and then I picked it up on Audible. I listened to it on the treadmill. Like it has helped me be a better parent as well. Like it's just tons and tons of techniques. So if you haven't got it, I highly recommend it from my from the recommendation of Kieran that the Teach Like a Champion series is incredible. So and now that I know some of it, I've read, read about halfway through the first one, I can hear it now. I know when Kieran's pulling from that awesome bag of tricks. It's not tricks too, it's just good pedagogy. Good. He said, good teaching. That's just good teaching. This is what we're all wanting to be here, right? Thank you for coming. All right, so any further questions about the project? Of course, we'll cover it a little bit more as we go. So, okay. moving on. You guys watch Odd Squad? There's that character in Odd Squad who's the doctor. She says, what's next? I just love that. My daughter loves Odd Squad. I love Canadian humor too, by the way. Okay, so block one, right across the top, big bold letters in the lesson guide, the ladder of inference. Well, all of you were here in December of 2020 when we had Andreas Vidmer talk to us about the ladder of inference. And those of you that are joining us via recording, we have it recorded. It's actually linked to, it's on a playlist of training videos. It is incredible. I was just listening to it again today to brush up on, on this, uh, this piece of pedagogy and this like theory, this ladder of inference. And to me, uh, this was actually, when I got involved with C, this was the first time I'd ever heard of it. Right. And so, um, uh, one of the things about the content of block one is it focuses primarily on using, not just understanding, but using the ladder of inference as you're learning how to make story and narrative. I tell people in the seed program, there are a number of things that we do not do in terms of entrepreneurship education. One of them is we do not have uh, a module on marketing. There are classes and you know, curriculum you can go get for that. The closest we get to a module on marketing is module nine right? The power of narrative, the impact of being able to tell stories. And so it's natural that we begin with this very important concept that Professor Vidmer says he teaches in every class, no matter what he's teaching, these students need to understand and be able to use the ladder of inference. So if you haven't watched it, or if you you were there when it happened, and you maybe it's time to watch it again, when you're prepping for module nine, and there's obviously there's a link in the lesson guide for that. So I would highly recommend that 15 minutes to you that it will take to get through it. And in fact, he tells a story how he, uh, he he used the ladder of inference during the pandemic lockdown when he was in Italy, in Rome, 
and and learned a very le- uh, important lesson about his own perception of reality during that time. In fact, he learned that he was wrong and had to change his behavior, which is the goal, by the way, uh, of education, like learning to improve and get better. So beginning with the uh, essential question, how do we interpret reality? And a phrase that has made my marital disputes and discussions safer and more productive, by the way, here's a little marriage advice for you. I have this, this phrase that I, I use, you know, when, when you're a significant other and you are not, uh, maybe you're in an argument, maybe you're like trying to discern and, and just love each other uh, because of something that you said. Uh, I have learned that I, I like to approach my wife and say, this phrase. I have a story in my mind that, and then fill in the blank, right? And what I'm doing is I'm introducing a narrative that exists in my head. And what I'm doing is I'm checking that narrative. I'm sharing that narrative against her narrative, right? And guarantee you 10 times out of 10, we have different narratives in our heads. Why? Because of the ladder of inference. We both interpret reality differently, uniquely, right? And because we are unique and unrepeatable, we have a different experience of reality. So this power of story and, and it, being willing to share, this is the story that I, I'm seeing and then get from the other, the story that they're seeing is so wonderful and powerful as far as creating this, uh, this, this bond, this collaborative uh, work together, right? So, which is why, you know, that's not that if you're wondering, if you just got here, that's my marriage is not in the seed lessons. It's not, but that's a phrase that I like to use. And I think you can use it in your, if you're teaching, right? When you're working on discipline, I have a story in my mind that blah, fill in the blank, but we pull from, for seed, we actually pull directly uh, from the, the um, well, it's, it's kind of a little old uh, from the sixties, but from popular culture, this Simon and Garfunkel song, the boxer, are you familiar? I know David is. I know I am. I, I'd be surprised if Elena had ever heard it. And then Kieran, no. Okay, cool. So 50-50. Excellent. All right. Inside baseball, the, um, it, it was not um, the, the group that's linked to it did not produce this song. They did not write this song, but they brought the author, the originator of the song in for the version that is linked. Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel. This is probably one of their biggest hits, right? Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is, it tells a story. What we want to do is use the lyrics from this song to share with the students and get their interpretation of what is going on in this song, right? So we're using that ladder of inference. Infer from the lyrics and the music what this song is about, right? So there's a couple of gotchas that I want to I want to put out there. One, in the lyric, in the lyrics, it uses this word, right? There's a line. Just a come on from the whores, okay? It's really fast. If your students have never heard it, they'll probably not hear that word, okay? Two things I would advise you about that. One, uh, didn't Jesus hang out with prostitutes? So there's that. Like, if you think this is not okay for Catholic school, really? Really? The Bible is riddled with them. <laughs> I mean, it's like technically the oldest profession. Not advocating it. I'm just saying it's there. So you're going to need to, if you want to prepare your students for the reality of reality, then they're going to need to get past this word, right? I don't use it every day. In fact, it's hard for me to say it. Oh, and by the way, Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute. That's a totally other conversation. It's biblically proven. Magdala was nowhere near where Jesus was when the prostitute. Anyway, so that's a totally other conversation. Anyway, uh, and then one thing about that is that I went and looked on Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is the no-no in educational and academic space. However, it's a Google away. And there's a really cool story of the, the genesis of this song, um, The Boxer, and when Simon and Garfunkel wrote and recorded it. Right. And there is a woman in there that says that she actually um, stopped Paul Simon in public. I try to never do this. Like whenever you see a celebrity, like I resist, don't be that guy. Don't stop them. But she stops Paul Simon and says to him, I sing this song to my seven-year-old daughter. But when I get to that lyric, I change it 
And she says, she, she substitutes the words in there just to come on from the toy stories on second Avenue or whatever street instead of the, it's the toy stores, not the, I can't say the word. I don't know why I can't say it. Not the horror. It's the toy stores. I think that's great too. And then when I was watching um, the video that we link, it actually shows the lyrics. This is why I would encourage you to print out the lyrics and give those to your students. Use the video that we use, but it actually has a couple of mistakes where they're not picking up the real lyrics. So there's a, there's a gotcha I wanted to tell you about. And then the most interesting thing that stuck out to me was the chorus. It doesn't have any words. It's lie, la, la, lie, la, lie, la, lie, la, lie, la, lie, la, lie, la, lie. It's because they didn't have words for the chorus and those were a placeholder. They were going to think of words later. And then the recording got out and then they were stuck. And now everybody knows, la, 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 la. Anyway, I think that's really interesting. Um, there's a huge backstory about this inference. People have inferred that this song is actually a diss on Bob Dylan. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I don't think Bob Dylan really cares, right? Or didn't at the time. Because when this song came out, more people were recording Bob Dylan's music than he was. And so he took a break. Um, but anyway, that's just some of the backstory and one of the gotchas on the boxer piece. And then I would encourage you to go watch the video of Andreas. I kind of got ahead of myself here. Sorry about that. The big takeaways for me about the, the piece with Andreas is that ask yourself, whenever you're looking at a story versus reality, we, we, we ask this, this question, what does it mean to me? Right? What does it mean to me? And that's kind of like, one of the first filters. If it doesn't mean anything to me, then I'm not going to listen. It's not going to change my life. I'm not going to take any action, which is back to the ladder of inference. So the inverse of that would be when you're preparing your story, one of the best things that you can think of, right, to, to encourage your students when they're developing their three to five minute Odyssey project at a pre preview at the end of this module, have them be able to answer, what does this mean to them? Them being the listener. What does it mean to them? And then Andreas, at the very end, the top of the ladder, the top rung of the, of the ladder of inference is take action. So what we want, the anytime that we're, whether it's marketing or whether we're just telling a story of something that happened, what do we want people to do? What, what is the call to action? I think that's something that should be in part of every story, right? And then I was thinking about, well, I'll, I'll say that, right? So there's, there's my take on the content and some possible gotchas in there. Some things to think about before you launch into this. And then we're going to have some, some wonderful pedagogical methodology and insight from our dear friend, Kieran. So I'm going to jump in and share some screens with that. So let me share. Are you able to see that on the screen? Are you seeing both screens up? Yeah. Oh, nice. Cool. I didn't know you could do so that. I have here on the right the lesson plan, right? So this is the lesson nine. And here we, and sometimes this happens a lot. It's a central question. It gets really glossed over. And I want to ground a little bit of this discussion around the this essential question. And this is essential question. And there's a link here, and I can put this in the chat to why we why we use essential questions and what essential questions are useful for. And it's really to get it at the high level of what so students are really getting and that we, we shared that sense of wonder that part has seeds. And that's where it's really great. It com comes back to the, one of those characteristics of the seed program, having students really wonder. And so this sense of an essential question is a good way to introduce that. Let me put this in the chat. And so there's some information here just on, on what an essential question is broken down for that. And so you can reference that and come back to that and just some defining characteristics. If that, and that one thing with the essential question is though, sometimes in education that kind of gets a little bit confused with, which were a little different with use based on the actual lesson, which sometimes is referred to as learning targets or we bots is another term that in education, this is what students will be able to do. And that's specific to the actual lesson. Whereas the essential question is more the 
the high level kind of getting them to to wonder and think uh, because you want you want to just not stay at the lower level blooms and and we'll talk about blooms taxonomy we you do want them that students to to go beyond but when you do the assessment the assessment piece of an less of a lesson on what students should be able to be should be matched with the right bloom taxonomy but you always want to encourage in these higher level thinking and in order to um, then it doesn't become rote boring work for students with it and that's where lever leveraging the essential question which usually is a lot higher level analyzing evaluate creating but then the lesson target or the block target what, what we have here these targets these these part here you can see are these lower level discuss and you can see here on bloom where where discuss define and identify is a lot more lower level and that's more the learning and then the essential question is kind of like a peek at this higher level and some students can start to engaging that uh, for that but that's not what you're assessing this is you don't want to grade that if you're going to grade stay at these lower level blooms or or with that and that's where this this important of this teach model fade technique or or use of graphic organizers. So so in this part, this anticipatory set that's connected with this through this song, and this is what that that song this lyric is, and a leverage. It's an anticipatory set, meaning it's it's kind of something that all students can engage. Every student can listen to a song and write something on it. And and again, we we mentioned last week these multiple intelligences. So multiple intelligence is don't just do writing with it. I know I know John also talked about um, having the lyrics printed, but there's power in having the students listen and and to close their eyes and listen and and not all focusing on just linguistic learning styles which we do. But there's there's different. This article here we can we can put a link into it talks about that that there's different styles. Um, and it could be video, it could be visuals, it could be be drawing here, bodily kinesthetics. They could act out what they're hearing. Here's, here's the musical, interpersonal, personal, having these these um, parts to it as a way, always. And a lot of times in education, we stay in this verbal linguistic intelligence level where it's, it's just written and words with it. But really encourage you that what C does is really tries to take on the the whole body and also that's the incarnational part of seed right we're bodily people we don't just we're not just reading but it's an incarnational and that's where that incarnation and wonder come in for it um and then we'd mentioned this idea of um graphic organizers is actually a great way to really support language to language and especially language learners and so a graphic organizer here could have been like john had mentioned the lyrics printed out and there's a or, or you can have students compare and contrast with Venn diagrams, um, different things, or this this uh, notion of, of as you tell this story or this this story um, with it sets it up for it uh, with it. And and again, you can see here in this lesson plan, this TED talk where you've got bits of videos um, with it. So even within this one block, you've got the written lyrics, the hearing lyrics, and even some visual aid. For that ways that you can engage these multiple intelligences and then scaffolding and supporting the learning when needed if if language development is hard through the use of graphic organizers for that any questions okay, I'm, having, I'm having an epiphany I'm, on that i'm having an epiphany what if we took and made a graphic organizer that was the ladder of inference inverted so as they're listening right, right they're like okay What's the data? That's select data. Paraphrase the data. What then? Name what's happening, and then when it's all done, explain, evaluate what's happening, and then so what? Right. Exactly. And so then that graphic what? organizer becomes what is an outline. And I'm going to talk to you about this later. Like a lot of before you write and you write well, you have students do an outline. There's no reason why that graphic organizer is the start of an outline and the start of a first draft. And that's Ooh, how you. Chills. And that's how you get enduring learning and deeper learning and it's the students words and that's where you can assess that and that's where they and again if they've had to pull it out of themselves and put it down on paper and then rewrite it into meaningful all that is just like learning that that's good gets good teaching good pedagogy good stuff
I'm an epiphany junkie. So you guys just saw what happens. Any other, any other questions before we move into block two? Here, and this is gold, brother. Thank you so much. It's so cool to like hang out with, with you and, and do this process. I can't, we're doing this from now on, by the way. I mean, in, until Kieran and I are like, you know, crypto millionaires or something, which is never going to happen, by the way. So, um, so moving on, block two, and what a great segue, because block two, we're going over the essential question of what makes a good story. And one of the things that, that we're using is we're using the module profile of St. Catherine of Siena. And we have created a very simple three column graphic organizer that follows what we call it well, follows the hero's journey. And the template is basically a, a graphic organizer of the three phases of the hero's journey. So kind of telegraphing a little bit, but um, so one question, and, and this is maybe spiraling because in the block two, we actually go back to the ladder of inference. So have any of you, and both of you, I guess, uh, and David, you were in the December training. Has the ladder of inference from Andreas's talk back nine months ago, has that come back in your mind ever since then? Oh, yeah. No, no. It definitely you know, is an impactful presentation. So, yeah, it's come back. <laughs> So then in there is a prompt that says, uh, in block two, it says, ask students to share how they noticed themselves using the ladder of inference since the last class. So how about, how about an answer to that? Ooh. It's been a while. It's been nine months. So I will give grace for that. That was a while ago. Yeah, I have to think about time where, you, where where I used letter of in, uh, the ladder of influence within my teaching or when I have seen it used by students is that or just in your life like oh uh this is what Andreas was talking about hmm. yeah, give me give me a minute to think about that let me yeah, yeah. we yeah, can come, come back and, yeah. and I'm just planting the seed here because that's in the content, right? It says, ask students to share how they noticed themselves using the ladder of inference since the last class. So from a sequence point of view, you'll want to do the ladder of inference, go away, come back to the next class, right? And then be like, hey, did you guys think about that at all? And, and then it has some prompts in there like, did it help them not get annoyed at someone uh, or be more charitable or how else? So there's some baked in prompts there about if this thing, this ladder of inference is so valuable of a concept that Andreas teaches it in every single class that he, he is a, uh, the leader of, well, then it must be doing something. And, and so that's a way to check back. But um, for me, I think I, I've, I'd never heard of it until I got involved, involved with Seed. But I think it has definitely been a, 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 a pedal, pebble that is a growing pile of pebbles around my sense of empathy for the world and the story that others are living in. And I know for a fact that I have used it as a trigger for myself. I tell my daughter, and I, I don't know, I've probably said this a million times. I say this every time we get together. I tell my daughter, dad, to tell me, dad, frustration is arrogance, right? And that I'm perceiving the problems in the world as just basically not living up to my expectations. Well, that's not how the world works. This is not my world, right? So my perception of reality needs to be much more empathetic. And I think that has everything to do with the ladder of inference. Um, also in block two, the elements of a story, we get into this concept of, and it's, it's a little bit brief if you ask me, I think you could lean into this more with your students and you teachers, facilitators, you have the latitude or not to decide this, but using the concept of Sonder, right? That's in block two. Elena, you're smiling. Does that, is that have a significant meaning or more than cursory meaning to you? Um, I'm just thinking like, uh, and people, my friends, they use Sonder and other terms like that as kind of like an aesthetic Instagram, kind of a lifestyle Pinterest board term where you gather all the pictures of you know a rainy city outside or a cafe day and you you put them around words like sonder and you relate that to areas of your life wow 
how did that get started? Like, I love your friends, by the way. It's just, it's just one of those aesthetic things you see on Instagram. That's cool. Um, and I, this is one that I'd never encountered before either, but I do, one of the things I do love about, you know, like, you know, most everybody likes to people watch for different reasons. And one of the reasons I like to people watch is because then I make up stories about what's going on in their lives. And this idea of, of like having the, um, this m- magnitude of, of narratives that are going on, right? Seven and a half billion people on the planet, seven and a half billion leads to their own story, right? Lead actors in their own saga of their life. When, when I go to an airport, I just love to think about, okay, you know, where are these people going and why, and what's their life like outside? And like, what were they doing before this? And what are they going to be doing after this? I remember being in the seventh grade and staring out the window and realizing for the first time ever, as the cars were going by on the road, there's a whole other world out there besides my life. Yeah. It took me a little while. I was 13 when I realized that, oh, by the way, I'm not the center of the universe. And I've re-realized it many times since then. So I love this concept of Sonder. And maybe maybe that would be a good thing to do is to put together an aesthetic board on Pinterest around this idea of Sonder, right? But what, what that reinforces to me is this thing that I'm trying to, to help people that are entrepreneurship students overcome is the myth of the maverick, right? In there, it talks about if we want to accomplish anything great in life or in business, we can never do it alone. So... Your story of this great entrepreneurial thing that you're you're doing or your vocation in life, whatever it is, it intersects that very same thing of everybody else. And so you have to think about why, you know, what is it that, about that? What does this mean to them? And kind of going back, right? So then who, you might ask this, like who, who, well, who's not a great storyteller in your life? Like who really struggles? And I bet you're thinking of somebody and it's probably somebody that you talk to and listen to a lot. And you're like, if only they would just tweak their abilities of a storyteller, just ever. So it would help. Right. But then who is a great storyteller in your life? Anybody who, who do you think of when you, when I say who's a great storyteller? You know, say I, I was just when you said that I was thinking of the, the the president of our high school. I think you might have met him, John Tim Navoni, who um, and not surprising, he's a good storyteller because he, he also came from a background of fundraising. So I think any uh, good fundraiser yeah. is a good storyteller, <laughs> and, and and Tim is one of the better. So excellent. What like in particular does anything stand out as to why? How come he's he's such a good storyteller? Well, well I, I think like, like a lot of good storytellers, he can uh, with words can paint a visual picture, right? So mm. you you can visualize what he is saying, um, which is helpful. It helps to connect to the story. Yeah, yeah, and that's because as we're listening, we're making up our own, you know pictures in our head right and it's uh if, if you're not a great storyteller that story that's going on in the head of the listener becomes something not even close to what you were intending well, something you can't connect right to. yeah and i think yes. the bad storytellers are storytellers where there's no connection meaning that um the the um objective facts of the story can be very interesting but if told in a way that you can't connect to it either, you know, visually or orally, it's, it's, you know, that, that, that's what the bad storyteller is. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Thank you, David. Any, in Elena or Kieran, any good examples or you want to talk about? For me, I'm friends with a bunch of theater people. And whenever we're all in a group, right, they're all bouncing off of each other, telling stories. And the reason I think all of them are just such great storytellers is that they have great rhythm. So if it's in a group of people, they know when to interject. Or if it's just one person that's telling a story to the rest of us, they know when to take a pause 
or when to go and this happened and this happened and this happened. So I think it's the sense of rhythm that they have to keep the story moving. Ah, and to allow interplay, it sounds like, right? Like it's not just me telling my story, everybody be quiet until I'm done. It's like recognizing, you know, that there's uh, um, to really good like cinema and play uh, theatrics, right? There's that wink to the existence of the audience, right? Being, you're not breaking the fourth wall, but you're at least acknowledging that they are there, right? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That sounds like jazz to me. That sounds like a lot of fun. Kieran doesn't like jazz, by the way. <laughs> on, on the contrary, my dad's Irish, so we have a lot of storytelling at our house. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. But I love and that man. Our indigenous culture in Australia, I, I share a lot, is like, and even our faith, oral tradition storytelling is who we are it's what's it's it's in us it's part of all culture at one stage it was the way to communicate the only way yeah Beowulf. yeah yeah this is why i like I, we have a fire pit you know we, we're constantly having fire pit at our house because it just you know that's when the best stories get told it just there's something so ancient about that uh, that's wonderful. And I think what it, it plays into so much of both, you know, other pieces and elements of culture, music and um, theater, and, you know, and being able to, to, to put that together. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you for playing along with my little silly game of who's a great storyteller and who's not. Um, I did do, I noticed one thing in prepping for this, this session for you all was that we did not have a key template for the hero's journey uh, pointing at um, St. Catherine of Siena. And in fact, there was a question that came up a month or so ago of one of the facilitators in training who was like, hey, I don't really get why St. Catherine of Siena is the profile. She didn't really like have a hero's journey, so to speak. So why, why is it that she's here? So I had that in the back of my head and I'm want, looking at this and I'm going, we need a key. So I did it myself. I tried, right? That's one of the things I love to, to tell teachers, like, just do it yourself. Like take the journey with the students. They love that. Right. And guess what? It actually does fit. It's not in the same kind of linear fashion as you would think. It's not the exact same story arc of the, the three columns of the hero's journey template, but it is there. And so in the document, you'll find now there's a link um, to the new key of the hero's journey template for the module profile. And in fact, I'll drop that in the chat here too, so that we've got that for everybody. Cause I want to want you to know that we, we do have that and that it is helpful. Right. And in fact, when we went back to the original, like design sprints of when we were starting to build C, it was like, well, we picked St. Catherine more because of the impact that her writing had. Right. It wasn't necessarily that her life was the story arc of the hero's journey. It was because she wrote all these letters and eventually got the Pope to move back. Pope Gregory the Eleventh got him to move back from Avignon, France, move back to Rome and to reconnect with with the Vatican there instead of courting the world leaders of the time, the French aristocracy. So that's an interesting story. And the fact double that down with she didn't know how to write. She didn't write a single letter her whole life. She dictated all of them. So, wow. I mean, there's a, there's a job too. Imagine being the stenographer for someone that is really bad at storytelling. Like that would be one of the worst jobs to have, I think. Like, oh, here we go. Like, and you're constantly interrupting and asking questions. What? Who? You switched pronouns on me in there. What? I, I'm out of, I'm lost. I'm lost. So she was able to do that in the, what is it, the 1300s uh, and, and, and get that done. So check that out. That is a brand new hot off the presses. And how about that? For creating a graphic organizer, Kieran. Very nice. So let me peel back some of this onion a little bit more. <laughs> and so I'm going to share. Do you see the two screens again? So we're looking here on the right, this block two. So again, that's, that's this essential question, I would say, and then that's a good one actually for a lesson target just because of the lower level bloom associated with that or a, a Sweebot if you wanted to pull that one for it. And that's where you really have that eye of seeing what the, the essential questions, if they're lower level blooms, can really help guide some of that start 
and what John referenced here is down the bottom here are the templates. So you can see in here the hero's journey template and this key using St. Catherine of Siena. And I'm a big fan of even when you have a template to do, as John said, is like that you can teach, model, and fade. So there's no reason why you could not do this template with the students. So here is here is the template filled out with that, and you can do it with in conjunction with the students, and then they too can then find their own hero. And having done one together with the students, especially with the with the um, content here of Catherine Siena, reading together, reading out loud, and then filling out the scaffold together here can really help support a student so that the task doesn't get in the way of what you would want. And so there's where this motion of teach model fade with that. So students then from this graphic organizer, can we do and actually do a writing prompt from that? And that's where we have this, I have this here, this writing process too, and I'll, I'll put this link in the chat with it. But the idea of a writing process is that when students write, they don't just you don't just say write, um, and that's you probably get blank papers turned in. But this notion of a pre-write, and this is where this graphic organizer becomes, or the hero temple here, the pre-write phase of just the good writing practice. Then draft, then revise, then edit, and then do final copy. And so again, all this this block here. Well, it's mapped out too. You can stretch this block from being one lesson or if, if you have this for more than one day, one lesson could be one day, 40 minutes, an hour. You could actually even stretch this block over two or three days if they're using the writing process in to write a really good descriptor of the hero journey using the template and that because you've set them up with these scaffolds and with this teach model fade approach, the students will be able to do it because you've set them up for success and given them what they need in order to do that. And then um, with that, this aligns very closely then with this Odyssey project, right? So again, all of the work, the blocks are helping inform and getting the student ready to be able to complete the Odyssey project, which is the, the, the goal of the unit, to be able to create this final project that they have for the rest of their lives that has formed them for that. And fortunately, it can also count as college credit too, right? Not, nothing wrong with that for it. So that's where um, really, really this, uh, this block can be, again, stretched out or, or depending on... Um, how you're using and how you're using seed and again another reason why i love seed in that way that allows you that flexibility uh, and how you're teaching it if it's one student or multiple students and so in the chat i put in just that resource there for the um, writing process and that's that's definitely a, more of an elementary thing um, but it's good writing good language arts teacher and that's where if, if in your school too they want co um, cross curricular is big you have to hit a couple of standards across you can um, you can say I'm, I'm hitting on some language arts standards there as, as well with that. Or if you're homeschool and you have to count this, this could be a, a way where you can count that towards uh, two lots of the grading with the integrate seed within your language arts curriculum as well. Wonderful. And, and we do like, Seed comes from higher ed, where we really value a student's ability to write. Right? It's it's kind of uh, overly weighted, in my opinion. Especially, uh, you know, if I had had a high definition video camera in my pocket in high school, I probably would have written a whole lot less teen angst poetry. Yeah. I'm just saying, we just didn't have the resources. So now a student, I think this is why TikTok exists. My impression, I'm not on TikTok. I will not get on TikTok. I get all my TikTok from Snapchat and from Instagram. But my impression of, of TikTok is that it's basically a platform of interpretive dances. I think that's wonderful. 
right? Whenever I say you can do an interpretive dance, all the old people in the room are like, oh, we're not hippies. Now that's like, you have to be able to do that to, to get any kind of traction on that platform. Anyway, I digress. Moving into block three, we're doing great on time, by the way. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in with us as we're, we're building out this model of how we go forward on these groundwork sessions. But block three is called the storytelling workshop. And this is the piece that I like to tell folks about when they're looking for an entrepreneurship program for their high school. We don't have a marketing module, but we do have a st storytelling workshop. And that's what marketing really is. And mo modern marketing has shifted from telling people what to do and what to buy to being in a place where people encounter you, encounter your brand. It's part of your lifestyle. Don't, people don't like to be told what to do anymore. In fact, they never did. But what marketing has realized is that you want to be part of your customer's story. So this is how we go about working on marketing in the seed program. We do a storytelling workshop and it happens in block three. Module nine. And the essential question is, how will you tell your story? One of the prompts I love, this isn't in there, by the way, but one thing I love to ask people is, what will be the opening line of your biography? Because that's the hardest thing to write. Getting that first line out is the hardest thing. If you've ever sat down to try to write a story, getting started. So let's have, let's think about that first line, right? And uh, mine's something to the akin of uh, there he stood, bewildered and befuddled, that it all worked out just fine. You know, despite his best efforts. <laughs> so, um, and to spiral back, this is a great time to have your students check back on their ideal life eulogy for module one. A lot has happened since module one, since they wrote that eulogy. And the Odyssey Project is supposed to be the next chapter, right? Not after they've been eulogized, but like from now to the next point, the Odyssey Project is that, a declarative statement around, this is what I plan to do for the next year or two, right? So go back and pull up those eulogies and maybe things have changed since then. Maybe something amazing has happened. Maybe something terrible has happened. It might be a good time to touch back on that. And one of the things that I love about module nine and in all of the modules, we try to have some sort of a, a nod to or a reference to the catechism of the Catholic Church. This one I particularly like, and I think it's very fitting. Um, it, it references two sections of the catechism, 878 through 879, and then two, 2493 to 2502. And 18, 18, I'm sorry, I said 879. 1878 through 1880, I think is actually in there. But 1879 says, the human person needs to live in society. Society is not for him an extraneous addition, but a requirement of his nature. And this next part. Through the exchange with others, mutual service and dialogue with his brethren, man develops his potential. He thus responds to his vocation. Through dialogue with his brethren, man develops his potential. Dia logos, truth seeking between two or more people. This is why story is so important. And this is why this, is, this hits right here, block three of module nine. Now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, that we're gonna give it a shot. We're gonna try it out in a safe environment with our closest friends and advisors, and they're gonna give us feedback. Don't forget, there is a document in module zero called giving good feedback. And that's something you can share with your students. All throughout this, we're learning to give feedback and learning how to accept feedback as a gift, as it truly is. And then Catechism excerpt 2493 through 2502 says thus, 2493 through 2499 speaks of truth in the media. I won't read it to you, but boy, does it sound a lot like cancel culture or basically an advisory against it inside of our Catholic catechism. And then 2500 through 2502 speaks of art as divine expression and cautions against art that is not sacred. Food for thought. Food for thought. Um, but it is definitely in defense of art as expression. And to Kieran's point about multiple intelligences, maybe we should try other things other than just writing 
the time. There are other divine expressions that can come out. Now, there are a couple of elements, element one, two, and three. As you can see, when we divide a block up, we call them elements. Element one is a game called Speak Out. There's a ton of, uh, uh, we got this from our partners at Youth Entrepreneurs, and there's a ton of video and resources on their website, but basically it's this. It's a game where and it, it really works great if you have, if you use a, an internal currency, like a fiat currency that students can earn by being brave enough and having the courage to get up there and do the, do the speak out. But one of the things that you can do, instead of just using the, the, the boilerplate ones that are there, what a great time to take the prompts from the module that says how, you know, you hand a student a speak out card and they have two minutes to talk about their answer to the question, how will your journey help or inspire others? Or you have 30 seconds to come up with a one minute talk about what about your desires would other people care about, right? So take that concept of speak out and apply the prompts from the module block that we're working in. Contained in the river boom. brain will label our subconscious. The ladder of inference. What is that? Was first proposed by Harp. David. Yeah. Sorry. I, I had video starts. I didn't mean to. Sorry about that. <laughs> Squirrel. That's right. That's right. So moving through, element two is about drafting your story. This is a great place to go and grab your life audit. It basically asks the students to do another life audit. And, uh, and worship and their worship time check. That's what I was telling you about, David, when we spoke earlier today. It actually has them, do you do this in module nine, go back to that worship time check. Yeah. Go back and look at things or do it again, right? Yeah. Um, make note of your biggest accomplishments in your life thus far is actually in there. And then one of the things that, um, that I like to always ask myself, especially when I'm meeting someone new for the first time, who, who is part of your story and who are you to them and who are they to you? And this is particularly important uh, when it comes to conflict resolution, because it's easy to, I don't want to say the word hate, because to me, hate is a, I, I think about hate in biblical terms, which when they said, hate your, your father and your mother, when Jesus said, hate your father and your mother, he just actually meant love them less. It meant something completely different. And by the way, hate is not the opposite of love indifferences. So when you're thinking about conflict resolution and, and when you're having trouble with somebody, ask yourself the question, who are they to you? And that will soften. That, that, that's part of my empathy bucket. Yeah, David. No, but as I say, in, indifference is the opposite of love is from a song I heard recently. So, Is that right? Yeah. It's true. Like if you hate somebody, at least you think about them. Mm -hmm. But if you're completely indifferent to them, you never, they never even cross your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's not loving your neighbor mm -hmm. for sure. So, and then element three is just practice, practice, practice. This is where you break them up into small groups. So this will be particularly challenging uh, if you're an individual doing a self-paced, self-directed version, or if a particular, you know, you're in a very small group. This can be really challenging. So maybe this is a great time to bring in help. Like if you've got family or friends, people that can come and just give feedback, that sort of thing. Essentially what we're trying to do is we'll get some reps. This might be what we call at bats here in Roach. Is that close? Right? And always go back to that giving good feedback guide. So to my friend here. Right, and so just with this block, I'm gonna just recap what we've talked about in the top two. So. Think of ways that you can help students with an anticipatory set, like something that they can all engage in before they start. Use graphic organizers that we've got when you when you go through, and that's where that um, having the speak out cards, all those opportunities, and using those um, youth entrepreneur lessons. Pull out these graphic organizers, leverage that. Use the multiple intelligences. It could be practice, practice and do a video and send the video the students practice um, with that. So ways that you can. And then remember too, if you are getting them to write and draft their stories, that just that writing process, build out how you can, what you can to help facilitate that. And then those youth entrepreneurs lesson guides also gives you a lot of good teaching prompts um, as you go through. Excellent. What a great segue. There's some supplemental blocks listed in the lesson guide. Um, both of them are from our good friends at Youth Entrepreneurs. The Pitch It is actually a remix of a game that you could buy on Amazon called Snake Oil, 
which immediately has a derogatory and negative connotation to it, right? The snake oil salesman is someone who sells you something that basically doesn't work. It's all false advertising. So we changed that to pitch it. And what pitch it is, uh, well, there were, there were many issues with snake oil. First of all, it's been discontinued. They don't sell it anymore. I have a, a couple of copies of it, but I'm hanging on to those. Um, it had some questionable words in the word stack. So essentially the way that pitch that, that snake oil and pitch at work is that you get uh, you get dealt some just some random words, five words that seemingly have nothing to go together. And then you draw from the hat a particular customer. And right, some of them are like realistic. Some of them are pretty far fetched. Like it might be you've got to take two of your five words and combine them together to make a product or service to sell to the customer. And the customer is like grandma or an alien or a prom queen or a zombie, right? And so what you're doing is you're getting really good at taking disparate ideas and jamming them together to make a, a business idea and then pitch it quickly, right? And the way um, the way Snake Oil was set up, it was all zero sum game. One player during each round took turns being the customer. Well, if I've been a zombie, how do I know what a zombie likes? If I've never been a prom queen, how do I know if your product service is any good? And that to me is always going to be resolved in a very political way. Who in this group that's pitching to me, do I want to be my friend, right? I don't like that at all. I don't. I completely and wholly reject that idea. So we hit it with a sledgehammer and we fixed it. And the way that you play pitch it, especially if you've got an internal classroom currency, like a fiat currency, is that everybody's playing. And everybody's pitching everybody else. And everybody has two bonds or one bond that is of no value to them personally. And it must be awarded to the person that you thought had the best pitch. Now, of course, there's still that political entrepreneurial aspect of that. And I can still award that to the person that I'm going to ask to prom. Fine. But most of the time, what will happen is, especially if you break them out and we play, uh, we play it at Texas Hold'em workup style. So you actually have like, tables of five students that are all playing at the same time. And then the person with the most bonds at the table at the end of five rounds or five minutes, they go on to the leader spot. And then there's four people up front that were all leaders at their table and they're playing the game in front of everybody. And then you get the Oprah effect because there's only four people getting bonds from everybody else in the room. And then with the bonds, what you do is as long as it doesn't have the person who's turning it into you's name on it. So like if I hand you a bond that says Kieran, one says Kieran, the other one says Elena, one says David Friend, and one says John Bakura, I get three credits instead of four because the John Bakura one was supposed to go to one of y'all, if that makes sense. And then there's a ton of information on the website about that. But it's great because you're you're doing all these kind of practice, quick rounds, quick thinking, pitching, creating business ideas. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we took in the pitch it set, we actually just made a spreadsheet of words that you could print out, cut up, put it in a hat, deal out easily. And we took all the questionable words in there. They literally had the word fart in there. It's like, come on, do we really have to have like, you know, of course you're going to make the fart gun. Once you get fart and gun in your hand, you're going to say fart gun. Um, that's a despicable me reference, by the way. And so um, he said dart gun. Silicon Valley startups is another one that they that they have. Um, it's a game that has to be purchased. It has many rules and gameplay is very complicated. This is a gotcha, like because anytime that it's confusing in your classroom, you're going to lose them. So I actually prefer a much better game than that. That's very similar, right? But it's not as technical and not as many moving parts. And you don't have to buy it. It's called Half Baked, and we could play Half Baked right here, right now, if we wanted to. What the way Half Baked worked is that. Let's say uh, the four of us are playing, okay? So I'm going to say a word. Kieran's going to say a word. Elaine is going to take those two words and put them together to form a pitch of a, of a product or service. Ready? Oh, and you got a 30-second pitch. So I would say something like toast. And Kieran would say something like fish. Toast fish or fish toast. Elena, take fish a second, toast. think about it. Okay, pitch us on fish toast. If you go over to the Philippines, you eat two things. You eat fish and you eat rice. Nobody eats toast because you have your carbs and your rice. Now, the innovative new product that we have here today is fish toast. You don't have to cook your fish separately. You don't have to cook your rice separately. You get your one thing and it's fish toast. You get your energy from your fish and your toast all put together. And since in the Philippines, everything is very hot, 
You don't need to wait around while you're waiting for the water to boil for your rice. You just grab your fish toast and you're on your way. And since you know COVID's hitting pretty hard there, you don't want me to be caught out in the city. You just grab your fish toast from the vendor, go back to your house and you're all good to go. The upside of fish toast is you don't have to have a plate with your fish and your rice. You just have your packet of fish toast. Fish toast for everybody yeah, in the Philippines. Yeah, yeah, I love it, right? And so then we go around. Then next time Kieran says the word, Elena says the word, and David says it. And then Elena says the word, David says the word, and John pitches it, right? So then you go, that's called half-baked. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And man, so Elena, great job, first of all. And the other thing that I know that I love that, that half-baked does and pitch it does and also uh speak out does is having a, a like a, a limit on time like that like 30 seconds or a minute and the more at bats you get with that then the student actually learns by muscle memory how long the 30 second pitch is or how long a two minute pitch is and they play in their story arc differently based on how much time that they've got so i'm a huge fan of half baked and tend to play it around the fire pit with adult beverages because then if it's a good pitch Elena, earmuffs. If it's a good pitch, everybody drinks. If it's a bad pitch, the pitcher drinks. So mm -hmm. there you go. It's a it's a drinking game, also. <laughs> and you know when your pitch was no good. You just know, like, <laughs> not like you, Elena. Yours was awesome. So a couple of things there that I wanted to share, and then hand it back for pedagogy and instruction, my friend Kieran. I would just say if you've got these games as as on the back end, if you've got a class, it's really good just to have some fillers in for time. If you've got a, you know, you might be in a, in a traditional classroom setting. So having, once you play game once, don't just feel like you're done in seed. So bring it back again and again with that. Or if you're seeing a, a lesson taking a southward turn and <laughs> it with something good, bring bring one of these games back. Amen. And you could start, you know, you don't have to wait till module nine. I'm sorry. You don't have to wait till module nine to play speak out. Like that's something that could happen on day one or day five or whatever, you know, these, and the kids, what I love about those kind of experiences is that they'll be asking for them. Can we play pit? Can we play speak out? Can we please? Cause it's so much fun. And man, when kids are begging to, to learn, that's when, you know, you got them, you got them. That's freedom right there. Okay, and then the last thing in the lesson is the project reflection. I think this one is a little unique. We, we do have a journal uh, project reflection or a module reflection in every module, but this one is in particular. It has some specific prompts. And so that's the, where I wanted to make sure that this is not just, hey, go to your journal, give us 100 words on what, you know, how you felt during this module. It's very specific. It's about you know, reflecting on the impact that the ladder of inference had on you. It's about asking and checking for learning around the understanding of the connections between that concept and the importance of stories of changing hearts and minds. And then there's their, you want them to remember their reaction to the Sonder video and the concept of Sonder. Like if they're like me, and this is the first time they've ever experienced, it, there's, there's a likelihood of some really impactful realization there. Right. And then learning what makes a good story. And then these, and I pulled these directly from the lesson guide, what is easy or hard for them to translate into a story for their Odyssey project? And that's a way for you to understand what are they struggling with, right? And I think that should absolutely go inform the next little, you know, the next several encounters with a particular student, but also grading the Odyssey project and a result. If you knew they were struggling on this one, one or two elements, and at the very end, they crushed it and it was awesome, please celebrate, right? Because that makes them know that they were heard and felt. There's nothing that creates a sense of belonging, like, like knowing uh, of people knowing what you were struggling with and celebrating your overcoming it. So. Right, and I'd say on the way of just reflections, good. I'm going to drop in an article here from um, Forbes magazine that just talks about why we should make time to reflect, even if you don't like it. Um, something just to read about too. And as John mentioned too, that if there's specific questions are great and always try and maybe give parameters around that. So do you want three sentences, five sentences, or does a drawing make sense here as well? So again, way, multiple ways that you can just assess that learning. And is it going to be graded? If not graded, you should. is it going to be read, commented on, deciding that ahead of time? Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. And so... Friends, 
Module nine, the world is your oyster. Yes, Any sir. final thoughts or questions? No, I think it's great. We, you know, um, yeah, th this module, I I kind of parted it out a little bit. And now having, hearing you guys go through it, I, I, I've now got to reconsider that. I think I need to pull these parts back together. I think it's um, may have been a mistake the first time through pulling it apart. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. For sure. It, 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 Thank well, you. And maybe, you know, I got to remember too, John, because this this module has gone through some iterations since this time last year. So um, we keep doing that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so it's having you two go through it again. Yeah. I, I better reconsider how I. That's wonderful. Yeah. I know when I'm, I, when I've got my father. Like when we're arguing about something like politics, economics, whatever, I know I've got it when he sits back in his chair and he goes, well, I don't know. That's yeah. when I know I've got it. Yeah. At least he's thinking about it. No. And, and you know, we, I, I've included these parts, but, um, but putting it together like this, you've, yeah, I, I, I like it. It, it. It's, it amazes even me. And you're different, by the way. You are not the same person you were when you made that decision. You, you're a veteran teacher now, David. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. So and I, 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 you tell somebody, yeah, yeah, and I'm going to learn from the master next week when Kieran and I go at achievement stories. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. Elena, any any final thoughts? Want to send us out? I'm excited for this module because of the storytelling and the whole ladder of inference. And I think in a homeschooling setting too, it's more, it's just naturally more discussion based as well, very informal. But even with the different ages you'll get in a homeschooling group, it's it's gonna be exciting to see all the different insights that people have because the way the blocks are broken down, they're almost building on each other, starting with like breaking down your assumptions and then going all the way up to building them back up with different pitches. I'm going to totally clip that soundbite and it's going to be on the website tomorrow because that was awesome. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, David. Brother Kieran, God bless you. Thank you for your hard work. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much. This has been Groundwork Session number nine, module nine. Uh, I have to remind myself it's September 2021. And I'm trying to imagine what we do this time again next year because this one was so good. We'll have to work even harder. But with that, I will bid you adieu and blessing. Ite, go forth. We've got tons of work to do. And uh, you, my undying gratitude and love for the hard work that you're doing. So God bless you all. Have a great evening and a great rest of the summertime, or uh, I guess it's the beginning of the school year. So Godspeed, everybody. Mm -hmm.